school for a, for a student to make a payment. I'm interested in that way. You need to form it. Yeah. If you're good enough academically to really be realistic in that, absolutely. They'll, they'll have discussions on how we can make this work. Um, yeah, I mean, they, they can't guarantee certain things, obviously, but at the same time, they can help try to steer people to make it where uh, financially it, 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 can, it can work for certain student athletes who are uh, capable of you know, academically handling it and obviously uh, have the skills to be able to play on the team too. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I just had a, a quick call up, call up when you were mentioning about certain programs of study at Penn State. Engineering is huge and it's really difficult to play a sport and be an engineering major. Even at Division Three, even at Penn State Harrisburg, I had a couple engineering majors early on and it was really hard for them to balance it. So when I was getting kid who like, yeah, I'm interested in engineering, I would have to have an extra discussion with them about what this was going to take. And this was only three days a week of practice to do that. So, and that can definitely play a role sometimes. I also had a question too, Brian, for you. I just, I, about practice. The amount of practice time for D1 schools. I mean, is it, are they pretty much going at it almost every day? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like you said before, uh, at the uh, Division One level, technically there has to be one off day every week. That doesn't mean a kid can't go to a golf course and hit balls on that off day either. It, it's, uh, it, it's, it's six, seven day a week uh, practice thing. Now, the organized practices within, obviously, NCAA guidelines, the number of hours, I think it's 20 hours you're allowed to practice or compete during the week. Um, we all know, particularly by talking about the pace of play in a college golf tournament, they play six hour tournaments. And sadly, it does happen even at the Division I level at times. Um, there are certain ways that they allow this to fit into NCAA rules. But no, practice is every day. And, and by practice, I mean um, there are even workouts. Uh, at the Division I level, it's not a surprise at all to have workouts Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays starting at 6 a.m and you work out at the gym and you do different things. Then you go to class during the morning and then you go to the golf course in the afternoon and you're hitting balls or you're playing in practice rounds and whatnot. And so those are uh, the kind of things that you're doing. And, and, and one other thing I want to know, about, definitely Chris, uh, you mentioned how you uh, set your lineups and whatnot. At Division I golf, it, it, it's similar. More often than not, most of the coaches have qualifiers. They actually have tournaments um, at their home courses or at their the clubs that they're affiliated with, and they have anybody on the roster, if they shoot the low enough score, you can get into the starting lineup. I mean, even if you go to a place that's a walk-on and don't have any scholarship and you're the 10th man on the team, more often than not, they're gonna give you an opportunity to try to track that lineup. Now, usually you're only playing for one or two spots in the lineup every uh, week, and then the coach is probably determining one or two and if the top player on the team has a bad week in the qualifier, those one or two are going to be held probably for the top player. But uh, uh, more often than not, even if you're at the Division One level and, and you're not, you know, the, the top person on the totem pole, you're still going to have to do a qualifier for those lineups. It's not like they're going to bury you on a bench. Uh, but you need to ask those questions. How do you how do you determine your lineup and how? You know, I know I'm not the one that you're recruiting more than everybody else, so what kind of shot do I really have? That's an honest question that needs to be asked. It sounds to me like the, for, the, for the kids to understand it, they really need to pick out their degree first and understand the academic requirements of that and how it blends in with the school's golf schedule. Is that, is that really what I'm hearing? To a certain extent, yes. I mean, I don't want to necessarily though say that you need to know what your major in college is going to be as a sophomore in high school. You don't necessarily have right. to do that. But you need to, generally speaking, know, you know, this is kind of where I think I'm going to be going down the road. I think I am interested in engineering. And if I'm going to do that, what school can I go to where I can get that degree and play college golf and let that balance work as best we can? And to un understand that early and ask those kind of questions, and I do think is important uh, uh, as early as possible. So you just aren't wasting time, you know, looking at schools that it's just not going to work out. At. If, the, if the aspiration is to carry it and you know take it as far as they can take it, is it really Division One that you have to in order to go pro, or is it Division Two or Division Three? Is there a, like what is the path to get to that? You know? there, there is no. Uh, foolproof path by any means. Zach Johnson played at a really small Division One school, won the Masters. Uh, Lee Jansen played at a Division II school, won two U.S. Opens. Uh, in women's golf, uh, Daytona State is a junior college right now that won six of its six tournaments last year, beat Division One schools at every one of those tournaments, had a player who actually played in the U.S. Women's Open. 
So um, there is no set. However, the Visual One programs, generally speaking, are uh, you're, you're facing the best competition on a regular basis. You're more often than not developing your game with facilities that will allow you to make that progression much more easily than at a Division Two or Three school. Can it be done at those other schools? Absolutely. If you have the dedication and the hard work and the effort, you're going to be able to 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 make your way. I mean, that's the beauty about golf is it's about the scores. And if I can shoot those scores, it doesn't matter where I went to college. I can play on the PGA Tour. So that's definitely available. More often than not, though, you're looking at Division One just because you're going to hone your skills better at, at that kind of a, a program. Ryan, is it a good uh, idea to look at, the, uh, regardless of what division you're looking at, is it a good idea for you to look at the team makeup as it stands right now as far as how many seniors, how many juniors, how many sophomores, how many freshmen? You know, if you're you know, a junior right now and you look and you see School X has got you know, five juniors and five seniors, you know, that might be a good spot for you to look? Is there actually looking for people? No, and it goes to the question this gentleman here earlier asked about, you know, redshirting and, and understanding what a lineup is. I do think it's actually not a bad idea to look at that and really try to find out, first of all, when you're approaching a coach, you should ask, how many people do you expect you're going to bring in from my year? You know, if I'm a senior, how many, how many people are going to come with me as freshmen in there? Because uh, that will perhaps determine what kind of playing time you really are going to be able to get and whatnot. And if you do see a roster where there's going to be some turnover here next year because all the seniors are graduating, and there's going to be a, the opportunity to play on a, a quicker basis by all means, I think that that's an a, a opportunity that you should to consider. And, and conversely, obviously, if they just brought in a recruiting class with three guys that all have 72 or lower stroke averages, you know what, cracking that lineup might be a little bit harder than uh, I want it to be over the next few years. That's going to weigh in the decision too. It is, uh, I didn't think about it, but it's a very subtle but very important thing when you do start to narrow down your list. Yes? Question. Um, could you explain what the difference is between D1 and a lower and D1 school? Um, more specifically, when you say the difference, do you mean from a competition standpoint? Yes. Okay. From a competition standpoint, Lower Division One schools still have players that are all shooting pretty good scores. They might not just be as consistent. They might not have had the, the resumes, quite frankly, that other kids had, and so maybe that's why they're at that Division One school. But the uh, actual com competitive level of those schools is still very high. Um, if, if you think, I mean, oversimplifying things, we think about Division One college level, and we think about schools in the South and, and whatnot. But uh, Northeast schools, the Rutgers. Um, you know, Penn State, uh, UConn, those schools, they've got players on those teams that, quite frankly, are all very impressive players with perhaps even, you know, plus handicaps. Um, the, the level of competition of those schools is still very, very strong. They're just not as uh, consistent, if you will, and they haven't necessarily gone really low and maybe necessarily made an impression on the national level to, to be looked at at a higher school. But uh, uh, I think they're still very, very competitive, and I think they're, uh, you need to assess then how your game is and, and try to look at those scores and see if you're still falling there. But um, you're still going to need to shoot pretty low scores to be able to play on those teams. I don't feel like I'm answering your question very well, but is there more something more specific? No, no, that's a good answer. Is that all right? Yeah. Sorry. I think maybe she was referring to like Stanford, Wake Forest. I mean, they go two, three days out there going, go a little bit today, but one day for them, all day. Is that? What they do in terms of their tournament schedules are different, yes. Uh, at, uh, and this happens as much regionally as it is how good a competition is. And Northeast schools frequently play in two-day tournaments where they're playing a 36 holes one day and 18 another. And it's primarily because they, they want to minimize the academics that, that you lose. And I mean, they're, they're trying to maximize the weather that they've got necessarily. Um, so they try to do it along those lines. But at the late division one level, they're playing in two or three-day tournaments. At uh, lower level Division One, you're still playing two-day tournaments. There's not very many one-day college uh, Division One tournaments, at least. Uh, more often than not, you're playing 54 ball events, and they just try to figure out how many uh, days they can uh, play them in, whether it's two or three, whether whatever of course is going to allow them. Obviously, to play two. So that's right. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. Um, if you've got questions along the way, um, 
I'm more than one to try to help you answer them. Uh, my email address is just my name, ryan.harrington at golfworld.com. Uh, I don't have all the answers, but I can do the best I can to try to help you or at least maybe direct you to the people who can answer the questions better than I can. But uh, um, I think y'all need to be really excited. College golf is a really, really cool thing, and it's going to help you down the road. Uh, I think uh, having said that you're a college golfer, I think uh, it impresses a lot of people in the business world uh, to be able to say that you had that kind of commitment and you played a sport athletically as a collegian uh, it stands out on resumes for the real world if you don't make it out on the tour. So uh, it, it's a good thing to be able to do, and I, I hope you all have fun with it. Thank you.